Hi, I'm Ed Scar. <laughs> and I'm Paul Allen. And welcome back, back to, to the brush. brush. And for the first episode of year two of the Back to the Brush podcast, we have some really cool stuff for you. We have uh, an interview, quite a long interview, with the guys behind the Elysian Fan Codex, uh, the Imperial Guard Drop Troops uh, Fan Codex. That is really cool. Yeah. Um, lots of stuff packed with cool stuff. And we'll be uh, talking with them about the development of that. Uh, also, just by ourselves, we'll be talking about some space marines and transports. Mm -hmm. uh, we'll be talking about some dog and cat models and some other interesting, funny, meme type things that have been going on. And of course, we'll be looking at some of the models that we have painted in the last month. Yes, we're going to be uh, uploading uh, 10 of the, uh, the most interesting picture, uh, model pictures. Uh, onto our Instagram so you can get a closer look uh, while we're talking about them on screen. Uh, in addition, uh, we have a regular slot of Autoredactus uh, with lists of, of, of faults and inaccuracies found in last month's video. Uh, this this Autoredactus uh, being the first one to review a video that I've edited. So we're all excited to see that. We'll see how cruel the order redactus can be but of course uh, if you want to add some things to the order redactus post a comment down below and start it with order redactus to correct anything that we've done wrong so shall we start off with some models that you have painted this month most of this month i've been working through my backlog of uh, death guard models um so those of you that subscribe to edge channel uh we are going to be doing a, a, a longer campaign after we did a, a little toe in the water job um a few months back now i think at the time of this going to to edit um yeah it's been a little while i can't remember exactly when that was so so yeah so i have been uh doing more of my death guard models um so i will i will start off with what i did first which is uh this rhino rhino um, so these are some custom parts by Scarecrow. Uh, so we've got the top hatch and the, the doors, which are very nurgly, and I've obviously painted them up all pink and gory and pretty cool. So this this Rhino I got used off of eBay, and it looks like they'd primed it with black primer and then primed it with red primer before the black had dried and it was bleh. yeah it had this bubbly texture yeah this yeah. is the hardest i've ever had to work to restore a model uh i mean obviously i've done like the rust effect i managed to retain the door opening i mean there's not a lot going on inside but thankfully it is a um a nurgle vehicle so if it does have some yeah some scratch bubbliness and... you can kind of yeah get away with forgive that. that yeah <laughs> he's pretty cool <laughs> Um, I also picked up some Chaos uh, cultists, uh, which haven't been painted yet, so I'm not going to show those today. But alongside some those, it was a Facebook marketplace. Uh, I got quite a few bits and bobs. Um, so I had, <clears throat> in the start collecting box set that I first got, which was like an Imperium one, it was three Chaos Space Marines, some pox walkers and then six space marines um so these three models are the ones that come in that set now this these three are everywhere if you go on ebay and you search for death guard it's just this brew of three models they're the poster boys of the death guard i yeah. think they were obviously in some of these starter sets and i think they were probably on the uh the magazine you know the um it's probably the same sprue yeah so there's loads of those um so in this lot i got the same three minis again um so obviously not wanting to use the exactly the same i've i've done a bit of a chop and slash so uh, these are the, the three some conversion work yes so all three of the backpacks are different because that's a nice easy bit um they're a separate part anyway aren't they uh, they are on these but these are easy build so they're all yeah. weird so this one his right arm is like a tentacle so really struggle with him i managed to get a left arm holding a bolt gun to make him a bolt gun guy um, this one was the um the champion so 
his backpack originally had a plasma rifle and then he had what he had a power fist so this is just a chaos bolter say so in a different backpack so he works quite well this one was a bit more problematic this just is a monopose so all i've managed to do is change the head and the backpack um that's something at least going back to this one interestingly the face was attached to the body so i had to cut that off and then build back up the body with resin and then attach the head kind of floating in there with super glue was that with the resin pen uh no that was with uh, this uv resin i got from amazon oh, okay a different uv resin but so this is the same this is a hard resin that's for jewelry making yeah so i got those and then i picked up this guy with the plasma rifle now he was on troll trader so i don't know if we discussed troll trader before that's a company in the uk they sell used models um for some reason he was going for three pounds and he'd been on there a long time to the point where he, he was in the reduce the clear section and i've got no idea why he was just a little plague marine no one wanted so i got him just because just because it's really good um it's got a resin base on it which is nice um there was a bit of mold lines that i had to sort of fill in down this side where it wasn't quite put together right mm -hmm. but other than that he's perfect don't wrong with him so quite chuffed with him yeah um, cool. and then i picked up two of the the blind bags so uh gw partnered with a company to do these was it bandai or was that the the big ones I don't know if i've got one of the leaflets here no the big ones was mcfarlane yeah now this is space marine heroes season three mm. games workshop no it doesn't list the company that made them anyway so they're made by a third party company but they're all unique uh models uh sculpts they're all unique sculpts um and interestingly these were the cheapest single death guard models that i could buy on ebay um so fair enough this guy here is the most common one in the loop yeah, and this that, is the second that, most mean, common. That, that's a cool way of adding some variety then so they've also got little nurglings on their bases and they've got molded bases but so this guy's like oh. a, a grenader but he's got a bolt gun on his hip has it got the sassy the sassy nurgle no nurgling it, yeah he's got a nurgling with some grenades and stuff it's pretty cool but but it, has the nurgling got like hands on hips kind of no oh okay there, there there is a famous nurgling that comes on the base of one of the i can't remember which model it comes on but it's the it's it the fans call it the sassy nurgling because it's just like and then this guy is pretty cool he has it the lower half of his face is just bone his skull and then there's like skin on the top uh it looks really disgusting which is cool so yeah so i've managed to bring up my total uh chaos uh army to two students of seven uh oh That's yeah good. i'll carry on. um so and then also from the troll trader um was uh, this guy so he's the, the champion so this one was very cheap and we couldn't quite figure out why he was so cheap uh so when he got here there's supposed to be a nurgling being squashed underfoot there but there was only half of it uh, okay i mean you, you can texture over that just make it a rock oh yeah i hacksawed over that and then i've put a orc skull from the box of skulls <laughs> because that just happened to be the right height to, to fit the base going up against uh paul's chaos is of course my tanner first and only and i have this month painted quite a few of them um technically speaking there are 13 models here but not all of them are actually going in the army directly and on the particularly bring out this one because it's another one of the pun models that uh Divic Designs and myself have been uh, challenging each other on who can make the funniest pun for the Gaunt's Ghosts. And and this is one of Divic's uh, 3D, 3D printable files, and I've painted oh, it. Oh, was it his? So okay. Yeah, so, it, so it's actually a collaboration uh, in this case. But this is a ghost commissar, and I've, I've added on a cloak because the model didn't have a cloak to begin with. And I used resin in a, uh, a silicon mould. I... Uh, 
when I first started with my ta Tanith, I actually made a little mold for cloaks, and it was the first time I'd ever sculpted a cloak to make the original version to make the mold. So all of the times I've used that mold, it's come from my first ever cloak. And so it's a long way from perfect. That It's got texture and scratches in it that, that aren't quite right, and that's been re replicated over so many models. But it fits... It fits the style. Now this one, to make him look even more ghostly, to make him look as ghostly as possible, uh, I actually had... Who printed it for me? Uh, that might have been me, yeah. <laughs> that that was you, yeah. I got Paul to print it in a clear resin because I've got a resin printer. I didn't have any clear resin at the time. So he printed it for me and then I've, I've painted it, glazed it. I've just glazed it. So I hit it with some, some white primer but really thinly with white primer and then I've glazed over the top and that's left me with this ethereal kind of very washed out look. You could say it was Gaunt's ghost. It is literally Gaunt's ghost. It Trying to paint in this style, trying to paint a clear model is a really weird experience for me and I, I don't know if I necessarily did very well with it but it reminds me of the like uh, the immolator that I showed last month, where I did all the window using washes. Yeah, see, that was a much richer color because yours, you didn't do any priming underneath, did you? No, no. Whereas I, I very lightly primed underneath this with white, and so it's desaturated everything. And so there's, there's definitely something to painting in this style, and I'd love to look at it more. Um, and maybe I'll come back to kind of translucent painting of in a way at some point going back to some of the other models um i've got some heavy weapons teams i've got a sniper in here somewhere um quite a few of these are actually devic designs parts because uh devic designs made a new version of his celtic guardians so i did a review video for him he sent them sent the files over to me for that um and i actually for another one in here if i can dig him out this one is a bit of a meme in itself because his cloak was made from sprue glue. Spru sprue goo. So go, get a jar, put some, just cut up some sprues and dump it in and then fill it with acetone or like half fill it with acetone. It melts down, it chemically melts down the, the, the plastic in the same way that polystyrene cement does. And then I grabbed a little lump of it and put it in the, the same mold as for the other one. And I made this uh, this cloak, and I did it just as just like I say, just for the memes, just for the joke, and it worked. <laughs> it actually looks not it's not perfect, but it looks really good. Uh, there's also some models in here that are by themselves not necessarily really interesting. Um, kind of like I've done stuff before, like a, a flame with a sculpted cloak. I've done one of those before. Um, I've done some of the some of the different cloak designs and I had spares so I've made more models and what I did is I just sat myself down and said I'm going to just paint a bunch of them for a video with no reason to actually paint them other than to paint them and so I just kind of churned through them and I did five models in two days. Have you got the one there the... that I saw on your Instagram which was like the sniper that was sort of standing at ease holding the rifle sort of like semi covered by the cloak? No, no, it was, they were like kind of, were kind of like, like that, with a rifle sort of. Ooh, ooh, that, that, yeah, that's not a sniper, that's just a rifleman. That is this one. Yes, yeah, I like that one. So th this one's actually, uh, it's a D&D &D model. It was just a, a ranger or something with this massive cloak that I've superimposed a, uh, a last gun into to make a Tanith first known only. Sorry, did you put that in the print? Yeah, it was a, a printable D and D model. To wrap up the Tanner first and only, I have a little doggo. <laughs> the doggos. <laughs> so this is um, uh, Liam Co. Liam Co. I'm not sure how you're supposed to pronounce it. It's a guy who's doing some three D design work for various models and has uh, done a little series of some different regimental dogs and he once he'd done a few he put up a uh, a poll to say well, what do people want to see next and the tanith won and so i got the tanith wolfhound 
and I said, uh, hey, send me some over and I'll, I'll do a video. So I've got that. And also from Liamco, I have a drop troop dog. Going to be really interesting for us today because we're actually talking, uh, our interview is with the guys behind the drop troops uh, fan codex. I don't, know, I don't know if they have an entry for a regimental mascot, mascot pug. <laughs> but I've got the model for it ready in case they do. This was actually a fun one to paint. Um, I've said before I have a lot of trouble painting 3D prints, uh, particularly off of my printer because of the, the texture that it, that it creates. But for this one, I decided to do things slightly differently. And so I went with the, like the cartoon style of uh, black recess lining and then ed like edge highlight kind of bright uh, raised lining. And combining those two, you can actually see clearly the every shape on it because I've outlined them with a, a light, a light and a dark. Now I haven't gone with every single line everywhere on the model, but I've done enough that you can see every shape. And I, I think this is one of the first three D prints that I've actually. I mean, it's certainly not good, but it's it's the first one that I'm like, this is this is that actually pretty. This is acceptable mid-tier <laughs> yeah, yeah it looks fine the um the tanith doggo is th there's a lot less finesse in any of the details because it's a, a cloak which doesn't have hard to find edges and the fur doesn't have any hard to find edges but the uh, drop troops one has it's wearing armor and has like the jetpack that has defined edges so it just makes that clear and for some other animals, I have been painting the absolute tiniest models that I possibly can. And these are going to need a, a nice close-up photograph. I have a single squig. I have a rabbit from uh, Bad Squiddo Games. And I have a fairy. And I think the fairy's the biggest of the three, and the fairy's about 15 millimeters tall. The rabbit's about 10 millimeters tall. The, uh, the squig, squig's kind of a different shape, shape, so it's kind of length that you'd measure, and it's about 20, 20 mil long. But they are all very, very small. <laughs> it doesn't take long to paint a small model. Um, but they're very hard to get the detail. Difficult to get the detail in, so it's probably not saving any time. Yeah. Certainly an interesting change of pace to sit there and, and paint through some tiny, tiny models. Some other tiny models I've got are some 1 to 72 ancient Britons, and they've all fallen over, so I'm going to stand them up. So these are Celtic warriors from kind of defending against the uh, the Roman invasion. This is a, an airfix kit from quite a few years ago, actually. And they're made of some horrible plastic that just doesn't... None of my glues. I've got solvents, I've got glues, I've got adhesives. I tried every single one I could possibly think of. Nothing stuck to them. Acetone, plastic weld, polystyrene cement, super glue, PVA glue. Nothing. Like I even started using tape. And nothing really stuck to them. But once I primed them and started painting them, the paint was... Like, you know when your paint's too thick and it kind of globs up? Yeah, yeah. I was thinning my paint to the point where it was water. And it was pulling like a wash and also still globbing up and it wasn't the paint because i was trying every every color of paint and it, it was doing it with every paint on these models oh one of them's got away <laughs> they're very small and they're all falling over ah. earthquake <laughs> earthquake in uh in south londinium uh i, I kind of wanted to use these for i, I kind of had this fun idea for a diorama where i can put my Last month I did a, a 28 mil Boudica, and I can put this big Boudica model because she's a 28 mil, and then these one to 72, they're about 18 millimeters tall. So I put all these at the front, big Boudica at the back. It's kind of that force percept perspective thing of having a big commanding officer over the over the infantry. Um, but these are just so unpleasant to paint that I gave up on the idea because the, there's I, I painted ten of them. There's like 25 plus two chariots 
in the box and I just thought the amount of unpleasantness it was to do 10 I don't want to do that again and then kind of a third batch would be it would take three batches to do the lot and it's a shame because the chariots look pretty cool so uh, the last model that I have painted but not based uh, is this guy uh, which is the uh, the Halbrute fancy terminator uh fancy dreadnought yeah so he was in the the big uh, lot i got from uh, facebook marketplace with the cultists um he was already painted really nicely to be fair i didn't know i could run him in the death guard army so i just put him in the shelf with the other generic models um until i spotted in the codex i could run him so i've paint stripped him and painted him up it definitely has the same style of um like bulbous biological stuff combined with the vehicle armor um in the same way that the what we're calling the moldy toenail moldy toenail <laughs> it's kind of the same style as that yeah yeah and, and they, they, they look, look great, great once they're painted, painted up, up in, in the same, same style. style yeah so yeah so that is all of the models that i've painted this month i have gone back to the lap the other space marines put a little bit more detail in because if you recall i kind of rushed them to get them ready for for our yeah, game yeah, I, I remember you saying that. um but um last week i got this thing and i was showing edit and he was like oh are those what the um the guy on ebay miniature rescues did yeah K casey from ebay miniature rescues he's done a few videos on different painting styles uh and he used those tanks he used the 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 copper rust technical paint on them and that looks amazing so i'm going to go back and do that yeah i have got some of it no idea where it is but um yeah i'm going to go back it's and do that on all the copper on the the shoulders and <laughs> bits of armor and things and the cats here hello cat in the background so i'm going to go back and, and do those now on the rhino i did do bits of rust on the on the gun metal and on the on the treads well pretty much everywhere the gun's got it on it and everything um but i, I haven't done any on the coppery stuff so i don't think i'm going to make it inconsistent by going over the uh, the uh, individual troops I've also got to have a play with this, some of these um, colour shift paints, which these only come today. So, um, like a green metallic that sort of shifts between, well, it's emerald green and purple and green, which I think is quite cool. Uh, so I'm going to have a play yeah, with those. Different, different refractive flakes that, that change the colour, depending on what angle you're looking at it. Yeah, um, so I'm looking yeah, forward to having a play with cool. those. If you're allowed one extra model at the end, I'm allowed an extra model at the end because I've got this, which is part of a collaboration between Miss Mini Life and myself. Um, there is a scene in a film. Uh, the film is Annihilation, and the scene is where the characters walk through a, um, a village and they see these human-shaped trees. And the whole sequence is eerie and spooky and beautiful and scary. And it's one of my favorite scenes of the film and it's one of my favorite films. So I definitely wanted to replicate that. And so I've had a go. Um, I used some of the uh, wood elf dryad bits, uh, like the leftover branches and stuff to make the shape of the person. And it's got like these clawed hands, which are... A little bit more spooky than I, uh, kind of a little bit more scary than I was after, but it, it, it's close enough. It suits. Um, but then when I got to doing the blossoms, because there's there's flowers or blossoms over kind of all of the uh, the figures, and particularly when you look at a group of them, they're all different colours. Love love the uh, the aesthetic of that scene. Um, but when I came to do mine, they're um, yeah. I think I can do better, but I don't know. What about how. taking to... the you know the ones that you use on your bases? That's cheating. That's boring. <laughs> <laughs> that that I I could have done that. I actually did consider doing that, but I wanted to, I wanted to make them myself. Yes. And so I had a go. 
I ended up with this, and like, as long as you as long as you keep it far enough away, it looks fine. Um, but yeah, it was it was interesting to do that as well because that's a a different style of build from what I'm used to. I recently acquired the Death Guard Codex, the the ninth edition one, uh, ready for oh, yes. the, the game me and Ed are going to play, and I noticed. Uh, interestingly, when I was looking at the rules for the, for this, so this oh, can right yeah. transport. Is it eight? I can't remember the amount number, but it, eight infantry models. These are all what I would call pr Primaris scale. Um, have I got a Primaris? No, I didn't. I didn't think that far ahead. So, so <laughs> they're the thirty-two, the thirty-two mil compared to the old school uh, twenty-eight. Thirty-five. 35 and 32. So, obviously, the Death Guard, the, the models that came out for the Death Guard were sort of launched with 8th edition. So they're all, they're all the style. The, they're now, they yeah, were. The, during the time of the Primaris. Yeah. So, this Rhino can transport this size model. And it can also transport this size model. But, if we look at the Space Marine Army, they can't. If they have a Rhino, <laughs> the Rhino can only take Firstborn. So, and your not, small not size. The Primaris. Not the Primaris ones. And the Primaris transports, which they launched at the same time, can only take Primaris size Marines. They can't take Firstborn. Now, it got me thinking. Because Design flaw. Why, if if they were just going to go, okay, yeah, we've resized the models, and you know that's it. So so with with these, yeah, they've just resized the model. There's no fluff around that. They just they're just bigger models. And the same with my sister's a battle army. I've got the old metal ones, and I've got the new plastic ones, and obviously those are the same size difference. Um, again, they can go in a normal rhino. But for some reason, the Space Marines, they can't. You've got to you've got to spend money on a on a new transport model. And it, I just find it quite intriguing that they only did this for the Space Marines. So they they came up with like background fluff to explain how there's these new Space Marines that are bigger. Um. To 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 write away the fact that they've. They've just yeah we've we've made slightly bigger models now, but they didn't do anything else, and it just seems odd to me. the 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 thing that really gets me is that it's not just the space marines, and it's not even the chaos space marines that are also going up in size, even though they don't have primaris or they're not said to. But all of the other races are, are changing in scale as well. Like uh, I don't have them to hand, but the character models for Gaunt's ghosts are thirty five millimeters. To the top of the head, 35 millimeters. Whereas the Cadians and Catachins that most people are actually using for line infantry are 32 to the kind of 28 to the eyes, 32 to the top of the head. But then if you go back further in time to the old metal Cadians and the Death, uh, not Death Corps, Steel Legion, um, Armageddon Steel Legion, they are uh, 28 to the top of the head or 25 to the eyes. So just over time, human, just normal humans are getting significantly taller. Which, which I, I don't see a problem with. I quite like them this size, just because it's e you got more, you can get more detail in. I, I'd much rather have everything stay the same size overall. Why go to all the effort of making up backstory for just one faction? Either yeah, and then not applying it to the chaos, who should have some. It's it would be so easy for 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 them to explain away why the chaos have uh, have Primaris. I mean, all they'd need to do is capture one Primaris and backwards engineer it, because the chaos can do that. Imperium can't. Chaos can. Yeah, it just I just don't understand why. You could have just you could have just said right, the Space Marines are now bigger, like everything else. That's it. Don't worry about it. They're just bigger now. And that would work fine. It's like they say, oh, you can use your old models as long as they're on the right base. So, for example, this guy I've rebased onto a 32mm base. So I can use that 
in a in a game as as a as a chaos boy as a as a death guard boy perfectly fine as as, as something that's half again the same the half again the height <laughs> i just don't understand why we are separating the the space marines i i mean i, I don't want to i mean obviously i've already in i've already implied it i mean is it just to sell more models like now you can't use all these rhinos you've got sitting around the house now you've got to buy i i remember it was just as i was sort of getting back into mini painting that that the primaris were maybe a few months old i think the primaris came first and then i kind of came back into mini painting art just a bit afterwards and i remember people saying the same thing that the primaris are just to make make all the space marine players buy new models <clears throat> and yes there that is absolutely part of it games workshop are a company and are abusing that fact but i would have expected them to like to to say at some point right the beginning of ninth edition right here's the new space marine codex they're a primaris you you cannot use firstborn anymore because they are out of date they are like they've been removed from the space marine uh, chapters but they haven't done that you can still use yeah firstborn and you can still use firstborn transports with firstborn space marines but then you can't mix the mix the firstborn and the and the primaris trump like with, with, with chaos i can and with sisters of battle i can so <laughs> it's a weird way that they've gone about things and it's sort of like they're, they're trying the corporate thing and trying to uh, trying to squeeze as much money out of people but then also not necessarily screwing everyone over as as far as they can by removing the firstborn. I, I, I think if they again. remove the firstborn, people would really kick off. Um, but I, I, I say mm. I, I just don't understand. You could have said these are the new space marines now. There's no fluff change. They're just a bigger scale, and that was it. You know, that's what they've done before. That's what they did with the, with all the other factions. Just why go to the effort of writing all this backstory? Yeah, yeah, I don't get it. I like looking on the list and seeing stuff marked as legend and go, ooh, ooh, what was that? And go and Google that. And that, that. that, yeah, that's. I tell you what, if you go through the orc list and find all the all of the legend stuff, that's the interesting stuff. All of the, actually, the most interesting stuff from the orc list hasn't even made it to legend. Yeah, because <laughs> like, they're only legend in stuff that was in seventh. I think, I think it was only seventh. Yeah anything older than that doesn't exist anymore like the custom lifter dropper and the bubble gun the 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 weird boy tower weird boys are back which is cool but the weird boy tower yeah well we can get a, we can get a big head now at some point. we can get a big head <laughs> we've already got one i'm right here <laughs> That was quite interesting. Well, so I don't know if anyone's uh, seen the new Big Ed model, but it's a gargant head that's been fallen over, and they've used it to make a defense. It's interesting that they haven't made the rest of the gargant. Yeah, it's just, it's, it's, at least it gives you an idea of what the gargant's supposed to look like, and you could kit back a head out of it. Oh yeah, if you, if you bought that kit, which is, it's like forty five pounds for a, for a. No. Yeah, it is. It's either forty or forty-five. Hang on, let's do some primary research by going to Games Workshop and looking up Big Ed. It's forty quid. It's forty quid for a single large brew. I think it's a, it's a double medium brew, which is the same as a large brew. <laughs> um. Yeah, I'm, I I don't care about that. I don't even. I'm not even remotely interested in it. I don't like the look, at all. Like I get that it's like interesting that it's a gargant's head and. It's yeah, a it's a nice idea that, for terrain. I do like it as as far as ideas like. Yeah, it, it's very orky in its style, so I'm not gonna I'm not gonna knock it too much. Also, as a I, I noticed someone someone who did an unboxing, they noticed noted that there are four big shooters in the kit. And all four of them are different models, which is nice. Yes. Because if they had all been the same, no one would have noticed. But orcs are famous for kind of... Cobbling it. R r rummaging around, getting stuff and putting it together and making it work. And having four completely different big shooters, it, it kind of adds to that. 
like I say, if 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 they hadn't done it, it wouldn't no one would have noticed. But having having that is just a nice little extra touch. Yeah, I quite like the Mech Boy yeah. Workshop model. I think that's got loads of detail in it. I just think it's a cool little. We keep we keep coming back to this. You like it. I'm the orc player. You like it, and I don't. <laughs> right, I like terrain. <laughs> Actually, that's a good point. You like the terrain. I like the I like character models. I don't even like horde infantry much anymore. I used to, which is why I've got a horde orc army and a horde Bretonian army. I mean, technically, I'm doing. People have described the Tanith as horde infantry as well. Yes. Yeah. Um, I would I would rather consider them veteran infantry than horde infantry, but. Well, yeah. I mean, obviously. Uh, as we've mentioned before, Ed is working to create a custom codex. And Henry, you stop it. Yes. Stop it, Henry. I am involved in the Tanith fan codex. The Tanith first and only. However, we should probably talk about a different fan codex. That being the Elysian fan codex. Where is my... Or the uh, the drop troops. Uh, fan codex not not just the elysians but i've got my drop troop dog to uh, cheer along the way i'll pop him on my microphone there which is ruining the sound probably can't be can't be ruining the sound more than than, than this <laughs> the cat has blessed us with its presence as we've mentioned ed's custom codex for the tanith um we got in contact uh with some of the uh, some of the community behind the uh, the drop troop custom codex, um, this is phenomenal. It, it if 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 this was printed properly hardback, you would not know the difference. Um, yeah. So we we got in contact with these guys and asked to do an interview. Um, so we got two of the um, two of the uh, the authors behind it. Uh, also model makers so we've got some nice artwork as well of and photos of their models to show you yeah a whole bunch of people from their their community have sent uh all different images of their uh their models as well so, so we've got a wide variety of uh of images that will pop up on screen of different units in different styles yeah but yeah let's pass over to us when we did the interview star wipe Well, thank you, future me, and welcome to Brother Bulpitus and the Red Cuffs for from the Elysian Fan Codex. Welcome back to the brush. So, if you'd like to just quickly say a few things about yourselves, about kind of the project that you've been running uh, in the last yeah, sure. three years. Yeah, Cuffs. I don't know if, if you're okay with me to kind of kick off. Oh uh, yeah, why not? Yeah, so I mean, Cuffs has actually been exactly one of the founding members. Um, I've only been part of the community for about um, just over a year or so. Um, but yeah, the, the community started um, a little bit over three years ago, so back, right back in 8th edition. Um, and that's kind of when the idea to do a full um, codex of the drop groups was kind of created. And then I think really in 9th edition with uh, our rules getting dropped by um, Games Workshop and being you know, effectively discontinued completely. Um, just kind of give us what the um, the impetus for, but yeah, basically for those of us who don't know, uh, we've created a uh, we're a community of about seven hundred members uh, on Discord, and we've created a hundred and eighty page um, codex full of uh, law, um, uh, photography, artwork, etc., uh, and most importantly, rules. It's a sta standalone codex of the um, for the um, Imperial Guard uh, drop regiments, and uh, yeah, that's that's what we're about. Yeah, I've I've had a quick look through the uh, the codex, and we'll leave a link to that in the description for you at home to have a look at. And uh, it is a very professional looking uh, codex, yeah, I'll yeah, have yeah. to say. Um, uh, Redcuffs, if you can, kind of if you're one of the founding members, can you kind of um, give us an idea of what the the lay of the land was when you started? Like, what rules were there for the for the Elysians yeah. to begin with? So we we started in the uh, eighth theft. Ed, I'll give credit to uh, this French chap called we, we we call him Sam, and he was really the main push from the uh, Elysian site. Um, because come eighth Ed, apart from the uh, index, there was very little for all of us who'd invested ourselves into the drop troops sort of uh, doctrine, if you like, mm. uh, for the Imperial Guard and. 
there he is. He, gra- he grabbed the bull by the horns and he just set about making his own codex. There was this German chap, Lesty, um, who created the Discord. It seemed a lot easier to manage development of a codex on Discord than it was on Facebook. Facebook was maybe a bit too busy. So it kind of gravitated towards Discord as just being a more hospitable platform. Um, and it, it grew from there. Uh, I jumped on. There's um, And the great thing I loved about it, which is a sign of the times, I suppose, is that it, it dragged in people from all over the world. I was yeah. just uh, to bro uh, earlier on that we've got guys in Thailand, Singapore. We've got guys in, in Australia and Buenos Aires. Uh, all over Europe, all over Canada and the USA. And it's just a really great, it's quite exciting to, to be part of. Um, so then back on the Codex, it went from strength to strength, from being just a Word document into what you see now. And um, Sam's done an outstanding job on there of making it. In my view, it's absolutely indistinguishable from a GW product. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, definitely, definitely. I'd agree with that looks are only skin deep you know but um I, I do think the first bite is with the eye and that when you look at it it's just the way it's presented you know gives it credibility as more people got involved it became more complex that in itself was a strength it's that's also ha- has to be something that has to be negotiated with everyone and we've got what we have now basically it, yeah. it's uh we're all very pleased and of course i don't know if Brother, you you mentioned it's in its alpha release at the moment. So we're kind of relying on. There's only like it's so sounds strange that although we're seven hundred strong, um, some more active than, than others. Of course, yeah. Of course. There are things we won't see in there because we were there when it was born. It's like watching your child grow. If you see them every day, you won't see it. We're kind of relying on people to get in there with a fresh set of eyes, have a look, pick stuff up. And uh, and be critical, really be critical about like why is this like that? Something got put pulled up today by someone, and it's like why didn't we think of that? And um, it's going to get addressed, hence the purpose. And then we'll release it as a beta, as hopefully something that's absolutely bulletproof, bolter proof. Yeah, the downside <laughs> is how many pages there. It takes forever to scroll. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. 180 pages is no joke. It is a very well put together piece, and like you say, the first bite is with the eye. It looks really professional. It's taken a lot of time to put together as well, and as uh, Koth said, Sam has worked painstakingly to basically recreate a one-for-one copy of a, an actual GW codex. You're you're talking about uh, actually getting some people to actually put these uh, put these rules to the tabletop. So, uh, brother, if you want to talk about kind of how does the uh, the the codex that you've that you've got so far, how does it play or like on the tabletop? So one thing is that we've created something really unique within the tabletop game. I mean, every faction, generally speaking, has got strengths and weaknesses. Space Marines, generally speaking, are very versatile, very durable. We also got relatively low model count. Cut goes super elite. Tyranids, you've got Horde, Orcs, you've got like a combination of like, you know, you've got Stompers or you go Speed or just like, you know, Boys and stuff like that. Oh, oh, we oh, think oh, that oh, a oh. drop through the army has kind of got like its own really unique kind of play style. And that is all about rapid aerial assaults, taking the enemy by surprise, dominating objectives, destroying key targets. And then the question is, can you hold that for the rest of yeah, the game? Yeah. So our major, you know, every um, faction within um, 40k has kind of got like a special rule that is their kind of like particular kind of buzz thing. For us, it's the air cavalry rule. So this is a new rule that we've created. It's a, basically a mirror for what base marine drop pods get. But if you've got units that are deployed in a Valkyrie, a Vendetta, or a Sky Talon, uh, it allows you to deep strike on turn one. It doesn't count towards the um, 50% uh, unit cap of how many units can do that. So it is theoretically possible to deploy an army that starts turn one completely from yeah, the yeah. right. I'm, I'm, I'm having sudden flashbacks to a very, very long time ago and a certain White Scars player at a tournament. Yes, of the uh, fruit conflict that uh, then uh, altered that particular tactic. Hopefully no one's going to uh, uh, do that to us, but that, that is potentially a risk. One of the things we have to stress really though is that we are not designed for tournament gameplay because yeah. there is so much work that was, I mean, anyone who plays a homebrew codex for a faction they love 
you know there's going to be that drive, you want to have a cause unit, you want to have a battle draw and stuff like that, and there's a real risk that you're going to have something that's completely overpowered. We want something that's fun to play with, but also fun to play against. And so we've put uh, balance, as uh, Sam did it, um, re really kind of like the, the core of what we do, so that it, that it's not too swinging. Actually, most of the playtesting games that we've had, according to the data that we're getting so far, games have either been very, very close, and we've actually lost. <laughs> so I think we, we hope, hopefully is a good sign that we, you know, made it thematically balanced. Yeah, but, you know, hitting the balance. Yeah, I will say I'm, I've been working on the Tanith first and only fan codex that we've uh, yeah. got running. We're nowhere near as, as far ahead as you um, in terms of time, people, or kind of actual presentable uh, codex. But one of the things that we could keep keep coming back to is how do we keep it balanced? Because we, we want to make, we want we want all of our favourite characters to be like seven wounds and Special, yeah. two, two, <laughs> two, two plus ballistic skills and all of this and like, tone it down keep it keep it sensible keep it balanced um well, dark, no doubt knows how um, fragile officers um and commissars are they, they they don't tend to last very long yes sadly. um we've got a lot we've got a lot of commissars in the tanith i think the thing is if there's going to be an exploit the kind of person that's going to use an exploit in a game isn't doing it for fun anyway are they they yeah they're doing it for the wrong reasons um yeah. So, on, mm. By selecting our rules, uh, what what we actually try to do to to maintain this balance is to uh, draw similarities to existing GW codexes. So with maybe a stratagem or a rule or an ability that said, well, this codex has got it. There's a precedent there, and you know yeah. we're not putting something out of thin air that's like totally outlandish. Yeah. And then that in itself, we, well, I mean, that's a good thing to do, but then that in itself, we're thinking, hang on a minute, are we just cherry-picking all the great things from other codexes to make an Uber code? So it's time to almost overbalance itself. Making it fair, I would say, was probably one of the greatest challenges. I don't know, bro, what would you what would you say? It's designed for the beer and pretzels, kind of clubs, <laughs> and maybe friends, in my opinion, the best kinds of 40k games. The f yeah, you know, the, the this, fun this is, thematic. Yeah, it's not designed for like a win at any cost play. It's going to go through rules and warrior it and basically find whatever you know exploit or something like that. If you're the kind of person who played Iron Warriors in the last edition, or I don't know, Admet or whatever in, in this one, etc., and you deliberately you know just do it just because of powerful codex for about three months before it gets FAQs, it, it, this this isn't designed for you. This is this is a passion project. Um, it's yeah. just like I said, it's designed for fun games. Is why we've worked so hard on like the crusade element, the rules as well. A lot of people play in match play, but you know we we you know and, and this you can actually play this in match play. So as the Elysians have been, from from my knowledge, I I was back in I was kind of third edition days when when I was really involved in forty k, and I remember the Elysians being talked about in hushed whispers back then. Um, <laughs> what's what's the kind of give, give me an idea of the law the background in in 30 seconds no hesitation deviation or repetition <laughs> yeah. I, want, I, don't, I don't actually play elysians I, I play my own um drop version i play the uh, arnheim pathfinders who are loosely based on on world war ii british paris um yeah okay uh i'll do my best so elisa is a planet they specialize i think they've I think what it is, is they've got like a, a planetary sport, which is like skydiving, although it wasn't written like that. And then they've just militarised that and they, they produce drop troopers, which are essentially guardsmen in every way, other than the fact that they uh, they fall out of the sky with grav shoots that have been produced by the lowest bidder. And um, it sort of steers the unit to, to, to be launched into specialised type operations uh there's also a d99 unit which uh was i think the amphilion project which are there kind of surgically enhanced you know surgical enhancement where they're a little bit tougher and better and a bit more stoic than than your average uh, human uh they're, they're quite special they're they're in the codex as well almost in a sort of sub what would you call it it's kind of similar almost to what the military tempestus are within the current am codex you've got a very restricted right, unit list in a d99 detachment so you can't take a lot of the rest of the codex then return for that you get some very powerful core units it's only 
kind of like set of structures, etc. So it's kind of like an army within an, within an army. And, and and that's kind of like what, what I do purely because you know my models end up looking like a a bunch of beefy guys, and I uh, thought oh, that, that suits the bill. They're like paratroopers. So to 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 make your own regiment based on any kind of para like something that happened in Arnhem or Crete or over the Rhine. If you look at those forces, what they have, very, very, like, high-quality troops, very light scales of equipment and short on logistics. It's not overpowered because you can only take so many, but there's a high, there's a large choice of your area assets. How Elysians operate is just like a reflection of real life, which is what did me to it. I've, I, my, I'm ex-forces. I, I was spent time on a para unit and after that i spent my last say seven years on uh, airborne operations in hel helicopter units and so i started this in um well during the fourth ed codex and in the fourth ed guard codex that was applied during the fifth ed rule set um you could take drop troops as a doctrine and i just gravitated straight to that because it felt like a like something i was familiar with yeah, yeah. That's, that's really cool so you've said um, that there's a lot of different regiments, even though you're calling it the Elysian, which is one regiment, there's other regiments that kind of use the same rules, kind of in the same way that 40k is based off of World War Two. There's a little bit of World War One influence as well. Um, someone could very easily use your codex to make, say, an American Vietnam like helicopter kind of. We've, we've got at least one person who's done that. We've got, um, I think it's Kelly. Uh, one of our one of our moderators, he's what kind of like part of the core team. He's, he's from Australia himself, and his regiment is basically based on um, the Australian um, SAS in Vietnam. Cool. Uh, among other things, I mean, the, the point is, we wanted you know, it's a homebrew codex, but we also wanted, you know, it's not. Yeah, games Workshop can sometimes, especially recently, be quite restrictive in terms of how they want people to play the game. We're all about creativity. And a bit so more flexibility idea, to it. Like now you can take it and you can run with it and you can add your own ideas to it. And it's it's a template. So we've got, I think, six named, named um, drop regiments within the Codex. Um, but we've also got custom rules to create your own. And we absolutely encourage people to you know develop their own. And what, one of the ways that we said thank you to all the people who've kind of like contributed to our community and you know, feedback on the rules and supplying artwork, etc. is we've got a regimental role of honour um, I think it's on something like page three of the codex. It's got a list along with the username of everyone who commands their regiment. So every person's unique regiment is in there, and we've got far more than just the um, Yeah, that's so cool. Yeah, it's, it's all about that creativity. I, I noticed that, and I didn't realise that was like the people who have been involved. Yeah, those are, those are all the members. We've got on our Discord, we've kind of um, uh, basically you can apply for your own channel within the Discord. And you can use that basically <laughs> to showcase your own models, your own law, your own battle reports, etc. And it's just like a creative space where you can really build and develop your idea and offer feedback on it. And I think, you know, latest count, we had something like 50 of those. So like every name, every named um, regiment that was on there, it's, it's in the codex. Yeah, I, I have to say, when I first came into your, your uh, Discord and had a look around, I, I've never seen a list of, of servers that long. It's... There's so much going on, and there is so much uh, to the to the kind of the project and the community as a whole. It is a really cool thing that you've got going. Especially when you discontinue uh, one of their particularly niche but very well loved uh, regiments, and then you kind of lock them down for eighteen months in quarantine. Uh, they will they will take to this board and they will write a lot of shit. People from other servers, uh, other forty k servers, quite like the idea that. I mean, the channels are free, you know, so just give give a channel to someone who, who wants to be creative or just showcase his particular uh, like work or talk, you know, the fluff or talk about their product. It's, it's their channel. They can do anything they like in it. And, they, you know, we name the channel after their... Most people give their units a name or a number or something and we just name it after them. That's their place. I think yeah. it's it, good for everyone. As you say, it's free to do, so why not just do it? make as many as you want? Yeah. It's, all, it's all engagement, isn't it? Pity us being the poor moderators who then have to try and please that. Shout out to the moderators who do all the hard work. Uh, so I notice on the 
uh, individual unit listings. You haven't got photos next to them. You know, on an official codex, they always have little pictures next to what well, they don't always. But most of them, they have pictures of the units. Will you be editing those in later when you've got fan created f photographs of each unit? Is that something you've considered? Or? That's going to depend on our uh, editor in chief, Sam, and, and uh, mm. kind of like how much stress we can additionally take <laughs> trying to cram everything into all those pages. I think yes, it's yeah. what we would like to do because it shows you a really good visual representation. Yeah. So, you know, but the, the response since we launched has been massive. I mean, we went when what when I first joined a year ago, we had 120 members. We've now got 700. It's and yeah. Cool release something it just goes through the roof but that also means there's a lot more people inspired to actually start building and painting their own stuff which gives us so much more pictures and opportunities to then yeah. use. you know on the discord we'll start doing things like um you know location would be like a painting competition whatever and that's great because that gives us so much content we can then put in the codex so it, it yeah. works very well for us so yeah, yeah we'll clever idea i like that so with with the rarity of the uh the forge world infantry models What's the best way to uh, to make? Are, are we talking like Acadian pushfit Acadian with some some jump pack? I think I think it's it's all about your own creativity, and we've got so many people who've created their own regiments. Up, you know, and not just these, etc. Mine, for example, the Anhang um, Pathfinders. Uh, I've got a uh, example. Here's one of me. Earlier, uh, this is like my blue at the moment. But this guy is uh, Cajun torso, Cajun last gun. Um, the beret kind of heads have come from the science kit, which I just bought on eBay because a lot of people use them, so I can just buy through the beret heads um, and to give them more poses and options and equipment, stuff like that, up from Anvil Industries. So we've got a lot more like needing poses, backpacks, you know, grenades, scopes, that kind of thing. Of course, Tanith player. My, my, Tanith, my Tanith first and only. I am very familiar. That I've taken it upon myself in the Tanith First and Only community to get at least one of every single option that is possible, make a video on it so that people can compare them and work out what they want for their army. So my army is an eclectic mix of everything. You know, I bought buy bits from people like Victoria Miniatures and stuff like that, and yeah. Mad Robot and Anvil, but not everything fits, not everything is exactly the right scale. And you can put down a lot of money basically on a gamble. And I've got so much shit that basically I'm never now going to use, and I'll probably put it all on eBay at some point. But yeah, it's it's, it's an expensive hobby. It is an expensive cool. hobby, yes. Especially especially when you're kit bashing. I mean, before Games Workshop products were expensive, when you start kind of like designing your own thing, the price. My girlfriend says uh, that I like to accessorize them, so I buy them lots of little shoes and handbags. That's the best way that she hands it. Yes, but, yes your I, little soldier dolls to make them look all nice. It, it, My little men is what she is what she calls them. I think it, it gives it's a good yeah. idea for for a bit of community content like a wiki of these are the these are the parts we bought from Victoria Minis that we think look quite well. These are the parts we bought from you know you could you could do some some very simple sort of wiki pages of how to build. And games uh, work, games workshop used to do that. You know they really yeah. encourage kit bashing like your own terrain features and and, and stuff like that and. You know, we, we live in the world now where Games Workshop, especially recently, you know, is being more aggressive with their IP policy. And, you know, we would love to put in the codex, like, you know, these are all like the 3D printing communities are created their own designs, you know, they're not rip off the GW products, they're their own unique thing. Yeah, yeah. You know, designed by someone, but, you know, we can't risk. No, definitely not, no. We make a drop troops army with GW models now. It just means incorporating models from other lines. So the tower... Uh, it can be represented by the, the uh, Ridge Runner from the Gene Stealer Cults. The Gene Stealer Cults also got the Goliath, and you can kit bash that quite easily into something that represents the Venator, which is the larger um, twin LAS cannon carrying vehicle. We've got Valkyries out there. You can make um, your Sky. I mean, we had a guy who made a Sky Talon out of a Valkyrie. Really easy. And. and like when I first started this, I just used Cadians as my drop troops because uh, in the fourth Ed Codex, you had a drop troops as a doctrine. Bang, I, and I'll just use mm. those. And it's perfectly fine. All the weapons, apart from a, the odd little thing like a Laz Cutter, which is essentially a kind of close combat weapon, um, I can't. there are a few others. I can't think of them off the top of my head because I don't really uh, use them. But you can use... You can make a good drop troops army represented in our codex, by our codex, 
with uh, existing GW models. Yeah, pure pure GW. So I'm wondering yeah. whether you could get away with um, this. Isn't the best example, but it's what I've got to hand. Like the the Chaos backpacks, because obviously they look kind of ignoring the fact this is a Death Guardy one, but they look mm. kind of drop shooty. If you yeah. de-chaos the Chaos backpack, absolutely. Yeah. I mean, obviously, an old school chaos one is what I was thinking, but I haven't got one to hand. And there's a Necromunda range as well. I think the Van Sars have got like some grab shoots in Vesper. Oh, that works. Yes. I, hadn't, I hadn't considered that. Yeah, that's a good one. Uh, yeah, yeah. So uh, representing the grab shoot on a model doesn't actually add something in the game. It's like if I've got if I've got a demo charge, I'll put it on the model. But there's no advantage in the game of having a grab shoot represented, and you know. These paratroopers don't carry their parachutes around with them, so I, I, I personally don't use them. I don't actually wear them on any models. Okay, okay. Yeah, my, uh, as soon as they land, my, my, they dump them. Yeah. My, my regiment doesn't use fancy uh, crap shoots. We are far <laughs> more grim and dark. We mass aerial drop into enemy um, flak fire uh, with oh. synthetic silk parachutes. Um, <laughs> I, just, I just feel that, that like, you know, dropping out of the marauder or whatever with literally just a tiny, flimsy bit of. Uh, Parchment going into like you know las fire etc. That that just speaks far more forty k to me. But as a result, they ditched them immediately, so they're not really representative of my model. I I just like the idea of getting um a like a maybe a sixty or seventy millimeter disc, doing all the texture as if it's just the ground, and then putting some discarded backpacks so that whenever you drop your unit, you could just lay that down on. It doesn't have any effect on the game. It just looks cool. It would make one hell of an objective marker. You know, defend. Yeah. Oh, so. actually, yeah, that as well. My brother, you haven't got uh, some paratrooper hanging from a church spire. I one of my um, earliest uh, childhood um, holidays was going to Santa American Lease, and they still oh. have an actual model of a U.S. Uh, soldier mannequin attacked by a parachute to the church spire. So oh, that's, yeah, that, that's, a, that's a future uh, terrain project. And again, objective marker: go and save, you know, private. Do some, somehow the chaos space rings have somehow not been able to see him yet, and you know. <laughs> Maybe we, we've covered it. I mean, you could maybe expand on like the the type of missions that that you take on with this. Um, so, for instance, I've I've written a campaign. It's not had a, a great deal of uptake, um, but it's a campaign to just give people something to try their try the codex with. Um, and they're all very much special forces type raids. Uh, there's some. Cool some ninth admissions um and i've tied it in with a bit of uh, aeronautica imperialis just to give it a kind of that all arms feel about it we've got one of our uh, admins is playing uh one of the missions today and they're all uh it's got it's got a nice little backstory that i think um is probably the best that can i can do um with you know coming it's, out. it's nice to have a narrative though because it, it's all yeah, very like well that. Yeah, it, having this this army and the and the established law, but having a, a narrative story to follow along, I think it's really nice, and I think it's a big plus having it written by by someone who is ex ex para. Yeah. Uh, that's pretty cool. The army, the type of army, is designed really for your 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 lightning type raids. I mean, you you could play it anywhere, but I think it is best suited. To the sort of um, the uh, 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 capturing objectives is, is the feel I got from reading the codex. It's, it's all about you've, you've got very very specialised elite units that have got a huge amount of turn one advantage and you know be alpha strike as, as we would mm -hmm. call it. You've got that ability to deep strike on turn one, so your ability to get all control and really target key enemy threats is really strong. But after that. All of our aircraft are toughness seven or toughness six. Um, all of our infantry are toughness three. We've got you know no invulnerable saves, pretty much in almost the entire army. So we are very very brittle. So it's kind of like horde deep strike, and with you know accurate, it's it's a really tactical army to play with because it's all about can you do enough damage to score enough uh, victory points within your turn one, turn two? Because after that, you're going to get ground down. You know, guard, guard squads will die very, very quickly. And we don't have tanks or anything like that. You know, our heavy firepower comes pretty much exclusively from the air. And that that's really kind of baked into our play style. 
So it's, you know, it's, it's do we do enough damage on turn one, turn two, and, and then can we hold out and survive? Which if you look at Operation Market Garden and, and you know, the British paratroopers and, and uh, the American Army first and 82nd, it was take the bridge, secure it, and then hold out until the reinforcements arrive. And that's all what we're about. It's been to play a campaign whereby you take the objective and then you say, right, the Space Marines are going to arrive in turn four. And glory, boys. Yeah. <laughs> You know, the, the, the Mordian the Iron blue. Guard will arrive on turn six. <laughs> Whatever objectives you have or don't have will dictate the next game with the Mordians. <laughs> my my ladies are coming and and the Battle Sisters, yeah, they're on the yeah. way. <laughs> we'll do the hard work. You can take me glory. <laughs> you know, it's, it's pretty thematic for uh, the Imperial Guard. They never seem to get any credit. It's just just um, a massive casualty list. I was going to ask a, a couple of questions that I picked up just from the codex that I thought was quite interesting. What's a drop weapons platform? Because I went through every model I could think of last night. Are, are we already, are we, are we dumping some errata on them? No, I'm just, you know. Is it, 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 it's, it's, our, uh, it's our thing on the Back to the Brush podcast that we have the auto redactus that comes along to uh, correct information. <laughs> Well, the, the oh. drop weapons platform was was uh, uh, that as a unit was my creation. Um, that was actually inspired. So there's a company called uh, Motion Tank. He's a guy based in Germany. He's got a, a shop I think been open for the last eighteen months or so. He makes some fantastic, like not Imperial Guard tanks, oh. and he also does funny enough drop troop range as well. Um, and he created some um, basically weapons platforms. So it looks kind of like you know um, old guard players and other things like saber uh, weapons platform that kind of thing. Um, where we're an army that doesn't have much in the way of heavy firepower apart from aircraft, we wanted to have something that you would drop in and use to defend, um, you know, let's say a forward operating base. So your pathfinders go in, they clear a landing zone, then you drop in like some heavier portable weapons. You set up a base of fire and use that for them to hold out. So, I mean, obviously my, my thoughts were like the, uh, the death storm drop pod sort of, that was what, how I was imagining that. Yeah. Um, one of the debates that we have kind of within kind of like the rules design is um, things like that. So aerial drop, the ability to deep strike is baked into most, but not all of our units. And so one of our questions is, well, should a drop weapons platform be able to deep strike? Now, in the opinions of some people, deep strike is things like, um, you know, coming in via uh, gravity or coming in via uh, teleport or something like that. And... Um, so, you know, you could then deploy, let's say, a punch a Gatling cannon on a drop weapon platform, nine inches away from a squad of, I don't know, boys or something like that. Okay, that's one thing. Or is that a little bit overpowered? Or is this something yeah. that, okay, you would drop in, but kind of like in crates, in bits, and then set up. So is that something... Oh, that's that interesting. That's so interesting. That shouldn't actually have aerial drop on its data sheet. We continuously have these debates, and we've got a survey feedback link and it asks some questions and okay these are some like the hot topics that we're not really sure kind of like where we feel about it and there's a lot of debate within the community and so it asks people to you know kind of have your say and the option to put in their own suggestions as well and there'll be things like that you know do you think that we've got this right do you think that we should change it uh the other thing i noticed was the recon bike squad now are those at just atlan jackals yeah, basically. Uh, yeah. Again, that's another one of my units. I just saw that. I just saw that and think I want to kit back and fit out of that. Yeah, yeah. We, we were the same. We were put some loud, you know, take away those shitty auto guns. Put some loud cannons on. Put some red, you know, maroon berets for like you know my my Arnheim, um Pathfinder regiment, and uh, you know zip around the a board, capturing some objectives and do basically no damage. Basically, a carbon copy of of what they are. Yeah, let's say, say we, we've looked at those models and gone, they're really nice kit bash. For, but... there, there is a sequence in, uh, like going back to the uh, the Gaunt's Ghost for a second, there's a sequence in one of the books where they get given some civilian bikes just to, just as part of a, a convoy escort. And oh, no, 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 no. people have been kit bashing and some of the best ones use the, uh, the exact same models, the Atlans. Um, yeah. There's also the Maximus, which is like a, a, a small troop transporter that we could take. You know, it's got a capacity of six, so it's like special weapons team, heavy weapons team. It can move command squads like, very quickly, like a force multiplier uh, around there. And uh, um, of course, they can issue orders from that there, those vehicles, which is very, very useful. So we've actually 
not just like the drop weapons platform made our or included something that's novel we've actually adjusted existing uh, concepts mm. and broadened them a bit so that they they do reflect what would you what you would see on the drop zone absolutely i think i think it's had to divine philosophy where we've got quite a few new units new units that we come in. Some come from existing um, G, you know, GW and Black Library law. Some of it are completely our own creations. And I think there's really one that needs to be an existing model for it or an ability to create a, a model from it. Yeah, of course. Otherwise, you get so many you know, fan-made units that never actually exist. You know, We've got to fight for page space when you've got 180 pages. You need to limit this at some point. Um, and yeah, it's also got to be thematic. It's got to fit in with what a drop troops army would actually have. Um, you know, it needs to be realistic. And you know, there's lots of great ideas that have been submitted that we kind of have to say no to. And a lot of other ones, you know, it's the beauty of having, you know, so much teamwork and so much shared creativity. You can take an idea and then you can develop it and you can build on it. And I think we've come up with some really good designs. And we're, we're thinking in, in terms of, you know, where this community go next, it will be a time when, you know, Hopefully, once the Ninth Edition Guard Codex officially comes out, we'll probably look at it, see if there's like any major changes in mechanics, like the order system or the command squads, and we'll then create a final version of Codex Drop Troops. But in terms of where we go from there, I think it's a lot of interest for us to do probably more of a Codex Supplement kind of format, um, but that would be for um, armoured regiments. So that would be a list of pure tanks. Um, and looking at motion stuff in terms of ideas for unit designs like tank destroyers and you know artillery vehicles and stuff like that. That could be a lot of fun. I just had flashbacks to uh, a, a, a white dwarf, and in third mm. edition there was the armored company. And, yeah. and you, you take le like a, a squad of three Lehman Russ as a troop's choice. And yeah. that, we, we we tested out that rules with um, stacks of books to represent the tanks. It was brutal. So thank you very much to Brother Bullpitus and to Red Cuffs for popping past to Back to the Brush podcast and having a word with us about their three-year project, which is coming along very nicely. We will leave links in the description below for both the Codex and also their Discord, if they want yeah. that publicised. Yes, please. Absolutely. Yeah. 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 So uh, do check it out if you're even remotely interested, and uh, certainly if you'd like to playtest some of these rules. So thank you very much for popping past, and uh, we'll see you yeah. sometime soon when you get back to the brush. Thanks so much for having us on my channel. It's been a lot of fun. So thank really well, th it. thanks very much for having the, uh, the read-through, giving our, uh, our project uh, some exposure. So, uh, thank you Red Cuffs and Brother Bolpitus, I think that's the correct pronunciation. Um, Close enough. <laughs> yeah, we, uh, we really enjoyed uh, collaborating on that one. Um, as we've mentioned previously in the video, Ed has already printed a drop fruit pug. Um, so we just thought we'd just talk about some of the, the pun models that seem to be appearing all over the Facebook groups of recent. Uh, there's no pun kitties though, <laughs> sadly. We, we need some kitty models. If anyone's yeah. watching that designs uh, these <laughs> a, a re regimental cat next yes really I, like I have heard someone cat, wouldn't you mate yeah <laughs> I, I have heard someone's working on a tanith cat with, that's just like wrap just rolled up sleeping on the floor with a with a cloak yeah that would be perfect cool i did ask the uh, drop troop chaps if uh the paint scheme for my pug here matches any of their regiments and it doesn't oh. yet so go create your own just kind of bright red armor and so this is something i'm gonna uh, if I get some other models, some science fiction models that kind of fit the bill, yeah, I'm not going to build another army because I've just spent however long building. The I think tariff. we were, we were, we did, <laughs> we did discuss briefly making a unit of of drop troops just to include in our Tanif games, but just a single. Yeah, it would be a fun thing to uh, to kind of throw in. Yeah. yeah, yeah, like ten of them, and then use some of the rules from the the codex we've just discussed. Um, purely just using two two fan codexes at the same time oh dear <laughs> well i think it just it would be cool to have some sort of um deep striking within our game i think that would that would be cool yeah particularly as as, as hopefully when my my drop pod comes i'm going to be able to drop strike myself 
Yeah, I'm not looking forward to that. <laughs> I'm going to have to come up with a way of defending against uh, B-Keys coming out of nowhere. Falling out of the sky in a big metal box. Big spiky metal mm. box. Spiky metal box. Anyway, um, let us move on to the Ordo Redactors. Um, yes. And as we mentioned, this, this month is going to be the first time Ordo Redactors have uh, evaluated uh, my work. Um, so let's see what they've got to say. Well, the uh, transmission begins. The Ordo Redactors report regarding the study of material entitled Back to the Brush, episode 12. That was last month's episode, of course. The completion of a full year. Firstly, congratulations are in order for surviving a whole year under the watchful gaze of both the Ordo Redactors and the interwebs. The first matter to be brought to our attention is there is no actual rule regarding how many generations in a family removed or cannot wear a family tartan. That's an odd way of gra uh, That's an odd grammar of, of that, but this is just discussing my... So I have a family tartan that uh, I may or may not be allowed to wear due to the number of generations. However, it does, apparently, uh, according to the Order of Access, that's not an issue. That's it. A real Scottish it. person has given you permission, so... Yes. Yes, a real Scot has given me permission. That's a tartan pass. Uh, family crests and coat of arms are very different, and this uh, does have the coat, uh, does have the uh, the family crest on it. Uh, for those unsure uh, who do not know their Scottish heritage, tartans such as the Highland Granite and the Isle of Skye are available for anywhere anyone to wear, and that's in addition to the 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 old Jacobite, which you would wear if you're fighting in the Scottish army as a mercenary. And also, this thing that you call the brooch, that's a kilt pin. It's a very nice one too, and it is a very nice one. Um, but apparently not a brooch. The thing is, it's on a scarf, not a kilt. And so while it may have been intended to be a kilt pin, I'm using it as a brooch. Therefore, <laughs> therefore... It is wrong, just in a different way. Therefore it's a brooch. <laughs> <laughs> Regarding Battletech, Engel would like to point out that he has already given Paul the rules to peruse and learn so that he may have a future opponent. The problem with that is that Paul doesn't read rules, he gives them to me to read. And so now I have got the Battletech rules, the, uh, the free ones off of the website I think they are, and so at some point we will have to play some Battletech and I'll, I'll read the rulebook and teach you the rules. And then you can play Andrew. Resume print. <laughs> I do have one uh, uh, that I printed uh, for Angle Cat downstairs where the arm didn't print. So I suppose I could just print another arm and super glue it on. Another arm. Glue it on. Yeah, job done. Easy. I uh I need to uh I need some mechs. I've got actually strangely from Engel, uh from uh the Order of Actors sent me a few months ago a um a Gundam. It's not quite the right size, but I'm sure I can make it work. Sorry, you did say that the game is scale, up not scale agnostic. So as long as the yeah. everything is in scale with each other, it doesn't matter. Well, I guess because it's a, a grid system, it's a hex grid. Uh, yuck. But as long as you fit inside a grid, it doesn't really matter. Because at that point, you're not using models, you're just using tokens. And you can use a model as a token, it's fine. But the, the actual location of the model doesn't matter anymore. Yes. So it's probably fine. The Order of Axis would like to say they are pleased with the level of ability demonstrated by Paul in regards to editing Back to the Brush episode 12. However, there were simply not enough cats. Well, there's been there's been cats today. There has. There's been two today, so... <laughs> uh, cats have uh, interrupted today, so that's at least something. <laughs> the, the photo of Maisie did appease us. She was cute and... She was a cute wee old kitty. Which I assume is Scottish for... Um, Say we Some, something. We old. We means small. Small old cat. And she's quite old. She's like seventeen, eighteen. Yeah. yeah. On a final note, it would be prudent to remind Ed that the Order Redactus neither forgives nor forgets. <laughs> Transmission ends. I don't know what that bit at the end was all about. <laughs> 
So with the order redactors report complete for this month, uh, let's remind everyone at home that you can post in the comments section below any mistakes that we've made or any more information about what we're talking about that you'd like to add posted in the comments with auto redactus at the beginning. And also, if you'd like to see some better images of the stuff we've been uh, putting on screen throughout the episode, please check out our Instagram post, link in the description, because that will take you there and you can just have a, a closer look without them. My nurgly boys. By, by the nurgly boys and my Tanith and, and that kind of stuff. And the dog, of course, the pug. And also we've got the stuff from the Drop Troops fan codex. So if you check out the links to their stuff, they've got Discord, they've got a fan codex in alpha release, uh, which looks amazing. I'm suspecting that when it goes from alpha to beta, it will just be a few minor like corrections and, and balance it, balance things. It's not going to be a massive change to, uh, to anything there because it looks so good and it's well thought out. As, as, as we've uh, mentioned in the uh, interview. And only only 140 really pages. <laughs> but with all that being said, with everything covered for this month, we hope to see you next month when we get back to the brush. I'm Edgar. Uh, Paul Allen. And see you later. Bye.